evening and welcome to Tinkering with Ed Kellar. Quite some time ago, Karpur asked me to create a display case for a piece of vintage electronics he had around. It is the PCB that came with an HP microprocessor lab, part number 5036A. Originally it was mounted in a suitcase, complete with power supply, but his brother found this one in the dumpster at his workplace and it came without any case or power supply for that reason. Carpour said he tried to power it up, but it wouldn't show any signs of life. Challenge accepted. The PCB says VCC1 and VCC2, so it did come with two voltage rails. I followed some of the traces and discovered that VCC1 is for the CPU and some associated parts and VCC2 is for the display and keyboard. So both need to be on at the same time for it to show any activity. So let's power it up. The good thing is that the board comes with its own diagnostic tools. The bus and some control signals are connected to LEDs and should provide visual feedback about the state of the different components. Here goes! No activity on the display or the output LEDs. Hmm. A quick glance at the scope reveals. A0 to A7 work fine there's square signals on them, but A8 to A15, the high part of the address bus, are way out of range for TTL signals. Activity, yes, but the voltage is way off. Looking at the circuitry, the address bus is buffered with two ICs. The lower half is going via a flip-flop buffer, because the 8085 has a multiplexed data and address bus, the higher part, which is failing, is going via an 81LS95. This is an 8-bit non-inverting buffer and it seems very much broken. was no immediate replacement. The chip has been discontinued for some time and the closest available replacement is a 74LS244. Replacing the caps again. Naturally. There's only a few electrolytics on here, but still, better safe than sorry. After waiting for two weeks for my ICs to pass through customs, I can finally replace the old with the new. But while the features are compatible enough, the pinout has changed quite a bit. I managed to add a few botch wires to the bottom layer only to reroute the signals. There's a slight improvement. Now the higher address bus is also showing activity. Still, 
it is not working. At this time I took out the ROM chip to save the image for posterity. That worked fine at least. I checked the address decoder portion next. Some of the chips in the upper right part are there to create the chip select lines for the different parts of the device, based on the address line inputs. The 74LS138, a 3-bit to 8-pin demultiplexer, seems the next broken chip. I think I got one of those here somewhere. Yes, jackpot! After replacing it, again, slight different result visually, but still, not working. <laughs> Looking at the different signals, most of them seem to be OK. But the data bus is looking more like a sawtooth than a rectangle. I tried removing the I.O. chip next. This one isn't really needed, but it is connected to the data bus and it is the same type of chip that was broken in the address bus. But no luck. Well, I guess that only leaves the RAM chips. There are two 1K by 4 bit RAM chips on this thing to make up for 1 kilobyte of RAM. They connect to the lower and upper 4 bit of the data bus respectively. I do have a 2 kilobyte SRAM chip here that I can wire up for a test. doesn't seem to work, but the data bus is now showing clean signals and the result is still weird, but it seems less random. Let's check… oh, I mixed up the A10 and right lines, whoopsie, let's try again. Yes, microlab up is the power up message according to the images I saw, success! Up next, ordering some replacement RAM. I might be able to botch in some other chips, but Carpour wants this as a display piece, so I'm doing my best to keep the front as neat as possible. Since the device is for educational purposes, it features some dip switches and jumpers. The dip switches disconnect the data bus, which will simulate a knob on every address, making the CPU run free over the entire address space. Good to detect anomalies there. The jumpers, labeled only W1 to W12, are fault jumpers. Putting them into the correct position will cause a specific fault, like address bus line 11 broken. I used a reference image to put them into the working position. the new chips arrive, I solder them in and ta-da, it works! Almost. Some of the keys aren't reacting and since the tracks are hidden under the keys, I can't tell what should be connected. So I decided to remove the keys and have a peek. keys all share one line of the keyboard matrix. I followed the trace to check for any breaks and f one of the fault simulation jumpers actually interrupts this line and I had it set wrong. 
since the board still has a bit of dumpster patina, I go over it with a magic eraser. This makes the whole thing shiny again. After cleaning the PCB and all the keys, I add them back to the board and glue them in place. And the finishing touch, I add the missing speaker. Beep beep! Up next, cutting the base plate from a piece of plywood. I'm sticking the cover plastic to the plate so I can cut once and have an exact duplicate. Also, this prevents the plastic from tearing out. I'm also doubling up the plate. The stock I had was not quite as flat as I'd like, but I also need some space in the backside. So I create a frame of some scraps, glue it on, weigh it down to dry flat and then cut the plate flush and square again. To make sure the barrel jack connector is sturdy, I made a little bracket of aluminium. The plan is to have a sandwich of a backer board with a power supply, the PCB and then the acrylic. I'm cutting out the center of the board to tuck in the DC-DC converters and a barrel jack. The clear acrylic needs a cutout for the keypad. I'm drawing the outline freehand and clean them up with a ruler. Since there are dip switches and some jumpers on the board, I thought, how about making the acrylic removable? I thought about hinges and stuff, but that would take away from the barebone design. After a light bulb moment, I fired up OpenSCAD and made a few specifically designed spacers as well as a mounting bracket for the DC to DC converters. I opted for two of them, since the PCB calls for dual 5 volt rails and it might be augmented with some expansion boards. The base plate gets treated with wood stain and two coats of clear paint along with some sanding. The spacers get a base coat of primer filler and a dark grey cover. Up next, final assembly. The barrel jack connects to the DC converters. which are mounted on the base plate and adjusted to the intended 5 volts. Yuck! Blue LEDs! Those have to go! The grounds of the output are commoned together and the two rails are fed into the PCB.
mount the board on the base plate with the first spacers. And then I mount the second set of spacers to the acrylic, using decorative nuts on the outside. The third set of spacers are cup shaped for a reason. Magnets! Here's a little cross section of my idea. The PCB is mounted to the base plate with screws. The heads are on top. The acrylic spacers use the heads for alignment and the magnets will clip onto them. This should be enough for normal operation and low magnitude earthquakes. And that's it for this episode, I hope you enjoyed this little project. I can't wait to see how it looks on the wall at Carpour's place. See you next time! I used the reference image to put them in the... <laughs>